Hey folks, welcome back. This is Mark Devine with the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. As you know, I do not take it lightly. I know your time is valuable and there are a million things vying for your attention. So I certainly appreciate the time. Today is a harbinger of really great things to come. <laughs> and my guest is Jordan Harbinger of the Art of Charm podcast and a book by that name and an all around pretty incredible guy. But before I introduce Jordan, we start little chit chat. Uh, let me remind you that the podcast is available now on Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and through our website at unbeatablemind.com slash podcast. And if you go there, you can also enter your email into our email list so we can keep you informed of all the cool things that we got going on at Unbeatable Mind, as well as our sister company, SealFit, and our Kokoro Yoga program. One last thing, the Unbeatable Mind Summit it's going to be held December 1 to 3. This is our annual gathering for the tribe where we come together and do some great training. We listen to some cutting edge uh, thought leaders presenting kind of the latest on anything to do with the five mountains. So it could be physical development, it could be mental, emotional, um, intuitive, or even Kokoro heart mind. So Unbuild Mind uh, Summit, December 1 to 3. Check it out at unbuildmind.com. And we're already more than halfway full. So you don't want to miss that. Jordan, this is take two for you and I. Welcome That's back right. to the Unbeatable Mind Podcast, buddy. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me back on the show. If you're if you're wondering what happened to the first episode of me on the show, it, there isn't one. <laughs> there is not one. It's, it, it's, it's in the black hole archives, right? Right. We went through the entire podcast, and when we were done, I realized that I didn't record it. And when I realized I didn't record it, I was a little embarrassed, so... We went to Jordan and say, hey, you know, we didn't record this. And Jordan says, no problem. I always keep a backup. But, drum yep. roll. <laughs> but what happened was I had cleaned out my hard drive and I thought, well, this is already recorded. And I don't know. I must have just caught up the, the last few shows because I usually only delete them when uh, when they're out. And that was the exception. The one time in five years when I accidentally deleted something before it came out. It happens to be the one time in as many years that. <laughs> That same person also didn't have a copy. So perfect well, illustration of Murphy's Law there. No kidding. And I was thinking about that. Like we literally spent 45 minutes talking about your your kidnapping episodes and we didn't have time to talk about anything else. So maybe maybe this time we'll shorten that down to like 35 minutes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so we get into some other stuff. So let me give you a little bit more color about Jordan. Jordan, you know, he's a communications expert. He used to work uh, Wall Street as an attorney, but they bailed on that. He worked for the State Department. He's traveled the world over several times and been to places that usually only Navy SEALs go to, such as North Korea and you know other war-torn regions. And he speaks five languages, uh, so he's an expert learner. And now he helps uh, everyday people learn the art of charm, you know, how to become a great communicator. So parents out there, if you want to learn how to communicate with your kids and Let's listen in. And if you're a corporate chieftain who wants to learn how to communicate better, then those are some of the things I'd love to get into today with you, Jordan. But first off, I'd love to just kind of get a little sense for the listeners about who you are, where you're from, you know, what were the what were the influences in your life that kind of led you to be such a uh, Indiana Jones kind of adventurer? Yeah. So uh, when I was a kid, I was... I was an only child and I was getting bored and that's always a problem. And so <laughs> right. I started to skip school because I didn't like it. I was bored there too. And I figured out, well, I got a computer and I got the internet and that was the end of, that was the beginning of the end. Yep. So I figured out how to wiretap those green boxes of phone pairs. And I, I borrowed a lineman's handset, those orange phones. And I started listening in on phone conversations and I'm hoping the statute of limitations is up. On <laughs> this particular day. But they're uh, coming to get you right now. I can hear I know, them. Right? Damn it. Um, allegedly I, I did this stuff. Yes. Um, there's no evidence to prove that it's I did hard to prove that, you know, cause they don't, you know, that, those phone lines are barely in existence anymore, right? That's right. That's right. Who uses landlines anyways? And so I essentially was listening in on, on conversations that were had by adults. And when I was 14, the only adults that were in my life were people that fed you, drove you places, yelled at you, gave you homework. And then there were your parents who were like <laughs> weird and yeah, not, not interesting somehow. And what was really interesting about this wiretapping thing was I was starting to get a picture of conversations and a, a picture of adult humans that I, you just don't get when you are a kid 
because they talk in ways that they don't talk when they're talking with kids around. And one of them in particular was my neighbor, and he was getting a divorce, and he would talk to his soon-to-be ex-wife in one way, and he would talk to his friends in another way, and he would talk to his sister in another way, and then he would talk to his mom in a way that was different from all of those as well. So it was a very interesting setup for me because I started to hear what people were like, and I remember thinking to myself, man, if he just talked to his soon-to-be ex-wife the same way he talked to his mom— He wouldn't be having these problems in his relationship. Instead, he talks to his soon-to-be ex-wife in a way almost like he's talking to his friends, you know, macho BS. And I thought, what a weird situation. And so I started to get to know and see human nature up close in a way that was highly unusual for a kid. And I started to get into more and more trouble doing that type of thing. I started to do things like cloning cell phones, which is where you basically reprogram a cell phone and you can hear other people's conversations that way and you can make calls and stuff like that. And I started to get into this sort of underground hacking scene quite a bit. And I got in uh, some trouble uh, that led to me becoming a a, a person of interest for the FBI, but I was so young that they didn't prosecute me. I instead sort of working with them. So it became kind of an upward trend because that was another time that was another not first time but rare time that an adult had said that I was smart and you know maybe could do something that wasn't just my mom or you know parents Mm -hmm. and that was important because I thought these are FBI agents these guys are smart you know they know what they're talking about so so they unpack that a little bit you got rolled up by the FBI but you were too young to be prosecuted so they basically said hey hacker you're gonna you're gonna work for us or else? Yeah, Is that kind of how they said it? Yeah, <laughs> it was kind of, it, it's the 90s, right? So what was happening was they, they busted a bunch of people for cloning cell phones. Mm-hmm. And then there's this 14-year-old kid and they're like, what? How did you do, where'd you get this? And I said, you know, I made it. I, I took the cell phone apart and I reprogrammed it and then I put it back together and they thought like, you're lying. And I showed them exactly <laughs> how I did it. And then I showed them how it can wiretap and I showed them how computers can get credit card numbers online. And they, they were like, huh, OK, let's call Washington. So back then there was a cybercrime guy or, or gal or two, and they were both in Washington. There mm-hmm. wasn't a cybercrime division or yeah, maybe even now FBI, everything is cybercrime. What do I know? So they were calling this Washington guys, and and they were like, yeah, this kid did this, 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 and this. And they were were thinking, like, how is that possible? Because they probably had one or two people that were doing the cell phone cloning thing in all of the United States that they had been catching and working with. And then suddenly there's this random kid in Detroit doing it. I, I mean, it just doesn't check out. So I started helping them with a lot of different little things. And I was helping one of the more junior agents and his boss, who was a more senior agent, figure out things that were happening online. So I would send them chat transcripts of chat rooms that people thought were hidden on America Online that were pedophiles doing weird stuff. And I would just fax them these transcripts. And of course, as you know, from a little document called the Constitution, law enforcement agencies can't just wiretap whoever they want. They can't just search whatever they want. But if a concerned citizen like me goes and finds something of note that's sketchy and sends it to them, well, that's different. Yeah, then they have to follow So yeah. I started doing things like that in a very loose relationship, and they started saying things like, hey, you should come work here. You know, we, we maybe we can get you a college scholarship. Maybe you should do this. You should do that. And I started to get almost mentored by these guys, and I, I realized for the first time that I wasn't just some sort of weirdo misfit. I was a weirdo misfit in a good way, and maybe I could get my act together. So my grades started to go way up, even though I was spending way more time doing things I probably shouldn't have been online. I started to realize that I actually had a future instead of just some sort of internet geek who was going to sit around in his underwear online all day. <laughs> and that was a, a a big deal for me. And that was the beginning of me trying out a lot of new things, you know. So I worked at the FBI for a while. I coasted through the rest of undergrad. I went to college where I wasn't smarter than everybody else when I went to college, but I was able to outwork everyone because everybody was drinking their face off. And so instead of natural smarts being my competitive advantage, hard work became my competitive advantage. And the same thing in law school. And I eventually went to Wall Street as an attorney, which seems like a far cry from the FBI, but that's sort of like that was yet another turning point as well. Because when I got to Wall Street and I realized that everybody was smart and everybody was hardworking at that level of the game, Mm -hmm. then I needed 
a new competitive advantage and I started to research what those might be. And that's how I got into the relationship building business that we run now here at The Art of Charm. So how did you get interested in law? I, mean, I do find that kind of interesting. Like you're, you're cruising along, you help the FBI, and all of a sudden you're like, I want to go to law school. What, what's up with that? Yeah, so what happened was I graduated from the University of Michigan. I've been studying Russian, Spanish, German, political science, and economics. And I made my own concentration. And my advisor was like, this is really unusual. It's really great. You know, these skills are going to be in high demand. And then I went to get a job at Best Buy while I was looking for other quote unquote real jobs. And Best Buy was like, yeah, we're pretty full, man. We're not really hiring right now. <laughs> and I remember thinking, but wait, I went to college and I did well and I have all this interesting stuff that I can do. And they're like, yeah, you know, we have some part time help on early like weekdays in the music department that you could do. Mm -hmm. And I thought sell CDs early in the morning instead of like, what am I going to learn from this? You know, and. And early on, even then, it was important for me to be learning something on every job or every career. And I tried to stretch my mind around what I might learn from that. But it's not like I'd never had a job. I worked at a movie theater before, you know, so I already had the old, like, basic responsibility thing kind of locked up pretty well. And I thought, oh, this might be a waste of time. And so my mom's friend was like, you should be a lawyer. And this is something that I feel like adults say to kids. No, it's just... <laughs> They just say, like, you should be a lawyer because it's a respectable career that right. makes a decent amount of money that isn't doctor, which requires a lot of prep. You can just sort of sign up for it and go to law school in the end, as far as anybody else knows. And so I went, uh, okay. And I had a girlfriend at the time who was also going to the University of Michigan, and I thought, oh, I'll just apply to Michigan law. Right. But the catch was, there's just one little hitch here, which is that Michigan law is one of the top law schools in America, and it's actually really hard to get in. You can't just apply, you can't just sign up for it, right? It's <laughs> right. not 1965 when you can just kind of go like, oh, I'm going to go to college here because I'm I'm from there. Right. It's a different game now. So I applied there. I got waitlisted, and I wrote a really compelling argument that said, if you let me in for next year's class instead of the current year, which I'm applying for, I will get a job and kill time in the meantime. And, you know, I'll put down my tuition deposit and I won't apply to other schools. And I didn't think that was going to work, but it did. They liked the way that I'd formulated the argument, the, the argument in the letter that I wrote. So then they said yes, which was a miracle. I mean, it's like really, really, really good. Uh, I had a lot of friends calling in, putting in a good word for me too, people that had been accepted. So that was kind of my first idea with leveraging relationships, although I didn't necessarily do it on purpose. I just thought it would help any way that I could. And then I had to kill a year. And I ended up going and working in the former Yugoslavia, which is kind of where the tr where, that's where the trouble started that we talked about last time. Right. Okay. So let's skip by law school and go back. I know Yugoslavia happened in that interim year. Let's let's dig into that because I think that you're already becoming a communications expert to some degree, right? You're you're studying languages. You had your early childhood experiences, kind of tapping in and observing how people communicated verbally. And now you find yourself in the war-torn region of, you know, the former Yugoslavia, which is now broken down into, well, Kosovo, right, and Bosnia and Herzegovina and all that. And you get yourself basically kidnapped, am I right? Yeah, basically kidnapped. And it's funny because when I lived there, the map, they weren't even sure what to put on it. People in, <laughs> in Serbia were yeah. saying Yugoslavia because it still had Montenegro, but then some people called it Serbia and Montenegro. And then they said, well, that counts Kosovo, so let's call it Yugoslavia. But then Kosovo decided they were going to try to be independent. So half the country called it Yugoslavia, half the country called it Serbia and Montenegro. Then Montenegro broke off and it was like, well, okay, I guess we're just Serbia now. So that, yeah, the people who made maps were like, make up your mind already, damn it. You know, we can't reprint these things all the time. So... It was it was kind of a, a mess, you know. And what, what and what were you doing there to begin with? Were you, was that State Department work or FBI? That was that okay. was State Department work. So I got a grant from, well, I, actually, it's Defense Department work. I got a grant right. from the Department of Defense to go and work and live in Serbia, hmm. and that was supposed to be totally civilian in nature. But their program there was so fledgling that the guy running it was kind of a knucklehead. This is where. It, it was just a, a mess. Looking back on it, they picked some academic turd with absolutely zero street smarts to run this diplomatic in initiative by the Department of Defense. Hmm. This wasn't a former military guy. He wasn't a government contractor. He wasn't 
uh, some guy who was sharp and had worked in the region. He was just some geek from wherever. And I say geek, normally when I'm talking about myself, I say geek. This guy was just a, a putz, really. He had no idea what he was doing, and he was never in town, and he never knew where I was, and he never filed the right papers. And that eventually led me to sort of do my own thing, because... When you live there, you have to register with the police every time you come back into the country. And I was traveling a bunch. I was moving around. I'd go to Macedonia. I'd go to Bosnia. I'd go to Montenegro to check things out. Romania, Moldova. I was, you know, taking a look around the place. Croatia. And every time I came back, I had to register with the police. And this guy was supposed to help me do that with the help of the U.S. Embassy and everything. But he was never in town. Mm. So I always had to do it on my own. And one day... I, I had a late flight coming back from, I think, Austria or something like that. And I, I went to the police station, which I had to do to register where I was. And they had a shift change or maybe the cop there was just being a prick that day. I don't know. But he basically decided that since I was in the police station at 11 p.m. at night, <laughs> that I must be a criminal. <laughs> And that's like so you're typical. Just gonna, you're just going to walk into the police station if you're a criminal. Like right, because that. that's how criminals apparently get caught there. They stroll yeah. into the police station and sit patiently on a bench. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> so I sat there and the guy decided, well, okay, you're clearly foreign and you must be some kind of criminal. So I'm just, I don't know what to do with you and I don't know what this paperwork is. So I, rather than let you go, I'm going to put you in a jail cell overnight. And I was like, what? I'm under arrest now? This is such BS. I mean, this is what it's like when you have zero freedom, okay? You know, I, they threw me in a jail cell. I was in there with a bunch of uh, gypsy or Roma women who were smoking. They were, they were prostitutes. They were there with their pimp or whatever. They were smoking unfiltered cigarettes the whole time and talking loudly in some language that I didn't understand. It was one of the most miserable nights I'd had. And I'd been through this police rigmarole crap over and over and over, bribing some fat slob to stamp a piece of paper that said I was back in the country and had checked in. And so I just decided, you know, to hell with this. This is the last time I'm going to do it. So I didn't register the next time I came back into the country. And, of course, the police being as disorganized as they were, they had no idea for months and months about where I was. And then one day they had, I think, I don't know, somebody had seen me on TV or I had landed back on their radar somehow, but I was AWOL, right? They went to go visit the place where I had last registered and I wasn't there, my stuff wasn't there, and I got a panicked call from my friend who did live there saying, you got to re-register now because the cops came here and they said they're going to arrest me and I live with my grandma. You got to go... And we got to re-register you now. And I said, cool. So I, she went in and deregistered me, and then I never re-registered because I wanted to find a place on my own, and I didn't want to deal with the cops. So I basically just went completely off the grid, and that started to catch up with me after a while. This podcast is sponsored by my friends at Ample. Ample is a new entrant in the healthy eating space that has created an incredibly convenient and super healthy complete meal in a bottle an MRE, or meal ready to eat. Just add water and chow down. Now this is more than just a protein shake. It is a complete meal, including the fiber and healthy fats, as well as the pre and probiotics that you need for proper gut health, and protein and carbohydrates in the right combinations from the right sources. I love these things, and I have one a day before my morning training. If you want to learn more, go to amplemeal.com. And the founder, Connor Young, knows how much I love Ample and is offering listeners a 15% discount off of your first order by entering the code UNBEATABLE15. Now, it seems I'm constantly on the go now, traveling, training, speaking engagements, seal fit academies. It's relentless. But Ample makes it so much easier for me to stay on track with healthy eating. And it will keep you on track while you're on the road too or at home. So go to AmpleMeal.com, place the code UNBEATABLE15, that's UNBEATABLE15, to get a 15% off on your first order and try out this amazing product. Hoo-yah, divine out. Okay, so when it did catch up with you, what did you learn about communications? Like when you had to basically talk and scheme your way out of a pretty nasty situation, Give us the highlights on, on how that improved, you know, your little toolkit so that you could, you know, get out of the nastiest situations in the world. And what, what can we learn from that? Sure. So the long, of course, the long story takes like an hour to tell. The short version is 
I get approached by these state security cops. These guys are not real cops. They are right. like Bosnian militias that now their village has been burned to the ground by Croatians or Bosniaks or something. So they live in Serbia now. And the way to get them to not be prosecuted for the war crimes they committed against other people's villages and towns is to give them a badge and say yeah. that they're an agent of the state. Therefore, they're a combatant in a war that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they can I, I don't know the exact legal loophole, but basically it's they weren't just random people. They were somehow under state control and we have they basically make it so that the state has no authority over them they fall under the direct con command and control of the president i mm. think so it becomes a huge issue and that was so that they could get around throwing these guys in jail for what they considered to be something patriotic doesn't so sound, these doesn't sound too far off from what we do in this country <laughs> yeah i don't know i i mean how does that work you want to with stay the, out of jail just work for the president <laughs> Yeah, pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah, good Until point. They throw him in jail and then you're in trouble. And then you got to go. Yeah, and then you got to go somewhere else. <laughs> so these guys, they they picked up me and my friend because they were looking for a few of us and they also just, these guys are known to, you know, rape women and stuff like that. So we were with a bunch of girls and we had the girls run in one direction and then I ran in the other direction knowing that they would come after me instead of the women. So they were driving in a Jeep on an island that has no cars. So it was a dirty, muddy road or non-road. And they drove after me and we let we let the girls get away. So since I had uh, fled and also they were looking for American spies, apparently, supposedly, they they decided to take me and my friend to their safe house. My friend was also, he had organized crime connections from back in the day. I mean, from way back in the day, from when he was probably nine years old, because his his dad was Saddam Hussein's lawyer. So he was connected with other unsavory figures inside Serbia. And these are just the kind of people you run around with when you're an expat that works for the Department of Defense in a country like Serbia. So... I wasn't exactly buying any brownie point, winning any brownie points with these guys being like, look, I'm just an English teacher. They were kind of like, uh-huh. And you're just hanging around with this guy's kid and you're just hanging around here and you're just unregistered. You're an unregistered foreign agent in the country. Got it. And um, which is funny because now I can use that term unregistered foreign agent. But before Michael Flynn, nobody had a clue what that was. Now people are like, oh, I've heard of that. I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was uh, an unregistered foreign agent essentially in the country, even though technically I was registered. I just wasn't registered in the way they wanted. I was registered with the government, but not with the local police. And that was good enough for them to take us to their safe house. Now, these guys were also high as a kite. They were or you know, on meth usually or whatever these guys were on was extreme. They were just extremely wired, red eyes, all kinds of screwed up. And they were armed, and so... You know, we ended up back at their safe house and my friend is getting his ass beat and I'm keeping extremely calm on the outside. On the inside, I'm freaking out, of course, but on the outside, I'm staying as calm as humanly possible. And I'm also the the takeaway here is not just keep calm and uh, carry on when things are out of control. The takeaway here is. You can control a situation by controlling your own emotions or your appearance of emotions. And so what this looked like in practice was that since this guy was angry and getting upset and freaking out and wired, I was asking very logical questions because it's very difficult for your brain to have an extreme emotional reaction and also think about something logically at the same time. So mm -hmm. when he was saying something like, you know, your country bombed us and we're going to we're going to beat your ass. You know, we're going to burn you. And they're bringing out, you know, cigarettes and electrical cables and stuff. And you say something like, well, you know, somebody has to call my boss because my boss is going to want to ask you a few questions. And they're like, are you threatening us? And I'm like, no, no, no. She literally wants to ask you questions uh, because she wants to know exactly where we are because she works for the government. And I think she works in the same department as you. And they're like, what? No, 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 no. Anyway, you know, shut up. We're going to beat your ass. And it's like, OK, but before you do that, um, I want to know what you like to do uh, at this certain restaurant, because I'm going to be going there later today. And they're like, you're, what? No, you're not going anywhere. What are you talking about? No, you are a spy. Well, OK, but if I'm a spy, how come I know a bunch of people that work in the same office as you? And they're like, what? Who do you know? So I'm confusing them a little bit, but not with totally random stuff, but with logical conversation. Yeah, and eventually I mean, almost exactly what like James Bond does when he talks himself out of a, you know, a really hairy situation until he can find some kind of lever or advantage or opening, you know, and then he just yeah. bounces. 
Yeah, I think the the reason that this works is not just something cool that I saw in a James Bond movie, for example. What the idea behind this is that I'm engaging the logical brain. And so right. eventually I find something that sticks. And it's very difficult for people to both engage that kind of talk and resist that kind of talk. You know, for right. example, if these guys were smarter and better trained, they would have just started doing what they were going to do instead of just y yapping up a storm and being right. threatening and trying to be, you know, tough guys. They would have actually put their, they would have actually executed their plan, which was whatever. I don't even know if they had one. So they, they screwed this up. And I started to talk about things like food, restaurants, light levels of politics that weren't going to get me in trouble. Mm -hmm. Uh, Areas around town, the logistics of traveling through their country, r driving laws, just really, really concrete, logical topics until finally the guy got really tired and he was frustrated, but he was more interested in talking about food and drink than he was in actually interrogating me because I think he probably knew that I had nothing to say, right? I mean, I was 25. I looked young uh, then. I look young now. I looked very young then. And I think he knew that what he was doing was just a bunch of BS. And so the idea that I was some kind of spy was just as ludicrous to him as it was to me. And so my friend was in the other room, and his guy, his guy was sort of going to town on him. So I think he thought, okay, if these guys are up to something, we'll get it from the one guy. So were we're they, starting were they to talk about him up, or what, when you say going to town, what were they? Oh doing? yeah, they're beating him up big time. Torture? Okay. Yeah, they're beating him up. They they had a needle. And they kept poking him with it in the body. It was Jeez. really gross, actually. Okay. Um, and he had to go to the hospital to make sure that he didn't have anything worse than tetanus, mm -hmm. which thank God he didn't. But man, they kept poking him with this syringe. That was really scary because he had all of these like puncture wounds. And puncture wounds are one of the most disgusting looking thing that a body can have. Mm -hmm. They're just really gross. I mean, granted, I've seen... It, it, I've seen gunshot wounds too on on you know the internet or television or something like that. Those are obviously more disgusting because there's more there. But mm -hmm. puncture wounds on somebody who's walking around is just really, really, really gross, <laughs> and especially when they're needles because it's just such an invasive thing to think you might have like AIDS, right? It's really, really gross. So they're going, they're beating him up and they're treating him really poorly. And I'm discussing with the guy who's interrogating me food, drink, restaurants, what to order when you go to certain places. So as you can sort of see, the logical thread of these conversations has started to really take root mm -hmm. with this guy. Now, he still feels like he's in control, but I know that I'm controlling the conversation, which sort of is a nice prelude to me running a talk show on the Art of Charm podcast because I control those conversations too in a way that makes the guest feel like they're still in control of the conversation, which makes for a better show. So yeah. that's kind of what I'm doing with this guy here. And I'm, I'm at this point, my plan is just look for an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Just right. try to figure out if you can get him tired or, or something or he goes to check on the other guy and maybe I can get out because I'm not restrained. I'm just sitting down. I am in a basement, but I'm not restrained. Mm -hmm. I'm not tied to a chair or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so this goes on for quite some time. And uh, we're talking about this. Uh, there's this homemade liquor that they have in Serbia, in the Balkans and in Eastern Europe in general. It's called uh, rakia. So you probably heard of Slivovica and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's something like that. Greece's version is Uzo, I think, and Russia, it's just they just make vodka at home. So this is kind of like a homemade vodka made from different types of fruit. And I we start talking about our favorite types of that because there's a million different kinds. It's very popular there. Even young people make it in canisters in the garage. And I said, yeah, man, you know, after all this, I could use a drink right now, uh, even though it was probably 8 o'clock in the morning because they'd had us pretty much all night. <laughs> And the guy and I keep talking and then he gets up for a second and he goes somewhere and I think, okay, this is probably my chance. So when he comes back down the hall, I'm going to die because he's still blocking the door. When he comes back down the hall, I'm going to put up my last stand here. And I see him coming back with a club and I think, crap, okay, I hadn't thought about him going to get something else. I better figure out what I'm going to do. And I'm thinking, oh, man, is it single leg takedown and then I get hit with this club or do I go uh, for the top? And then I remember, okay, you know, learning this stuff back in in the seer courses and stuff like that. It's control the weapon is what you're really supposed to do. So I'm trying to I'm brainstorming all this, trying to remember all this crap. When I realize he's not holding a club, he's actually holding a bottle and he comes back in and he plunks the bottle down and he goes, this is the stuff we keep here 
for when we're waiting. And I was like, waiting for what? I don't want to ask that question. So let's just, let's see what happens. So he plunks the bottle down and he pours us a couple of drinks and we're drinking this homemade liquor that they keep at the safe house. And I realize at some point that I'm drinking with this guy, which means, you know, I'm maybe not going to die here. I don't know. Still TBD. So your but buddy, I'm drinking your and he's drinking. Out of him and you're drinking with your, with your. Right, exactly. Right. I'm I'm drinking, but it could it could just be very James Bond like where yeah, I'm having a drink, but I'm going to get shot in the back of the head in 15 minutes and I just right. don't know it. Right. You know. So really, I don't know what's going on. And I decide after a few rounds, I said, "Look, man, I need some water because I haven't had any water for a long time and I don't feel good and I think I'm going to puke and it's going to be a big mess." And he goes, "All right, all right, all right. Hold on, hold on." And I realize there's no water anywhere except maybe back where he came from because I'm in a basement with rusty pipes sticking out of the walls and a, you know, car battery in the corner with a coat hanger stuck to it and I'm thinking, "You know, I know what goes on here." You know, and it's not it's not water and and relaxation and and chilling out. So my, I still hear my friend getting beat, and I, I hear the guy get up and go to the other room, and I'm starting to sneak around a little bit, and then I hear the Jeep door close, and then I hear the other Jeep door close, and I think, oh, my God, I think they left, hmm. but I'm not sure because he could have just had a bottle of water in the Jeep. So I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of here? And then I hear the Jeep leave, and I realize they took off, possibly to go get us something, or possibly they were done with us, or possibly they realized they left the ammo at the other place. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> But they had left for what I think they probably assumed was just a minute. My friend was unconscious. So I grabbed him, woke him up, Carrie, Carrie walked him, kind of, you know, he limped him over to a restaurant that was nearby. And they called the regular police who came and arrested us again. But, of course, this time took us to the police station. And uh, they didn't believe a word of what we had to say, naturally. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I described the Jeep and I described the, the car and I described where we were. And then they went, oh, got it. OK, you know, that's not something you can read about in a magazine and make up or pull out of your ass. Uh, that's something that, you know, is that's something that sounds true. Jeep with government plates, Mitsubishi, black, tinted windows, mm -hmm. runner boards in a safe house, in a basement, you know, that kind of thing. And so the police captain ended up calling, since my Serbian was crap and my friend was basically still unconscious and not able to speak, the police captain called his girlfriend, who was a language teacher, and I was there as a language teacher as well. So she knew my boss, who at this point was worried sick about me because and she'd been getting calls from these guys from my phone saying, oh, we're going to kill your, you know, your friend and all this stuff. And all my friends were freaking out. And of course, this language teacher, I just told her, call my boss. So she called my boss, who was freaking out, corroborated the part of the story about me being kidnapped by some crazy people who were calling her on the phone. And then the police cut us loose. They said, we don't want any part of this. You were never here. You know, and they just threw us out of the police station because they didn't even want to deal with it. And that was how we got out of that place in one piece. And I couldn't help but think that it might have ended up quite a bit worse had we not been able to buy enough time for these guys to either get bored or get tired or right. trust us enough to leave us there on our own. I mean, they were, as you can tell, they were poorly trained, but we had to make that opportunity anyway. Yeah. Well, that's a hell of a gap year, you know, between uh, college and law school. Yeah. No <laughs> kidding. What'd you do over your gap year? Um, well... <laughs> Went to Yugoslavia, got kidnapped a few times, you know. And had some great food. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I can see, I mean, that area and that thirst for adventure, you know, is going to eventually turn up, you know, some interesting circumstances. But that you didn't stop there. You know, after college, you decided to go back to places that most people don't think of going, unless you're Dennis Rodman, for instance, and just happened to be loved in Korea, North Korea. But you've been to North Korea. What was that like? Tell us about that experience. Yeah, North Korea is... Because it's been in the news quite a bit lately. and people. Are it's been in the news it. quite a bit lately. Yes, that is correct. North Korea is legitimately one of the weirdest places... The weirdest place I've ever been. Really? It's like a completely fake... It's just completely fake in almost every way. When you land, there's an airport that has nothing going on. And there's no lights on half the time. And... There's one, There's pictures of the leader up on the outside, and there's no other planes, and there's no other flights, and 
you know, you land on this runway and they there's no jetway. They just put up a staircase. Mm-hmm. And the depending on if you fly Air China or the North Korean airline, they don't leave the plane, uh, which is also really strange. The, the flight crew will stay on the tarmac in the plane, Air China. Hmm. And the, of course, the Korean crew will come out and, and help you get down the stairs. And then you walk into this airport lounge and or lounge airport terminal and there's soldiers that are there for immigration purposes they don't stamp your passport the lights again are not on there's there's a baggage carousel that looked it's probably powered by some guy you know on an exercise bike and it's a million years old (laughs) and you get in there and you go through and they're opening all your luggage they see an ipad and they don't know what it is and they look at your camera and they say does it have a gps and they take your cellular phone and they put it in a locker and give you a receipt on a piece of essentially almost tissue paper and you've got to get it when you leave because you're not allowed to have a mobile phone there at, at the time when i went and you you get on a bus, and the bus driver has a piece of paper in the front windshield with your name and your picture so that mm-hmm. they know exactly who's on the bus and what you look like. And wow. you get on the bus with your luggage, and you you get in there, and the tour guide says, welcome to the Democratic People's Republic of, of uh, Korea. We're headed to the hotel right now. And... It's just strange. There's no street lights on the way from the airport to the hotel. You see people diving out of the road uh, in the bus headlights. I always like to sit up front. There's tons of people outside, just hundreds everywhere, and there's no lights, and they're just mm. walking in the dark. It's just unbelievable. And you get to a hotel, and the hotel for tourists only has tourists, and it's on an island, mm. and you can't leave the hotel once you get inside. They don't let you out. <laughs> and and you're just kind of thinking, like, what did I get myself into now? Yeah, right. And, wow. you know, what, what, what was your mission in Korea? Like, what you were you just were you visiting as a tourist or did you have some other kind of nefarious uh, mission? No, I was just a tourist there okay. all four times. I went there four times as a tourist and and led trips there with other Westerners. And it was a very strange place. The, the guy that recently died after coming home from there, mm-hmm. he was in that same hotel. And I know he was mm-hmm. on when he stole that poster. He was on a secret floor in the hotel that you can find because when you take the elevator, it goes one, two, three, five, six, seven, and you notice there's no fourth floor. Mm -hmm. And you can't get to the fourth floor from the stairs because if you try to take the stairs, there's, and I'm not even kidding, there's someone sitting in the dark or knitting by candlelight 24-7. They're on the staircase to make sure that you don't accidentally wander up onto that secret floor. The way that you get to (laughs) the fourth floor is you take the freight elevator, which is located in the lobby of this hotel. You take the freight elevator to the fourth floor during the days or during the times that the freight elevator is on when the attendant is not there, when he goes out for a cigarette or whatever. Hmm. And that's how you get up there. And when you get up there, there's meeting rooms and there's all these posters. And I guess he ripped down one of those. And that was that was what did him in. Yeah. Huh. Okay, so you got to be able to leave this hotel, though. I mean, like, you don't just go to North Korea and hang out in this hotel the whole time. Right. So the hotel has a ton of things to do in it. It's amazing, actually. It's not a great (laughs) hotel, but it's just got bowling and swimming pools and a karaoke and five restaurants. It's pretty incredible as far as hotels are concerned. Socialists are really communists. Really, they're big on, like, this grandiose crap. So they've got a hotel there that is not or I think now it's finally possibly open, but it was a giant concrete structure and it was 105 stories tall and there was nothing in it. And it was, it's, it was built in like 1981 and left to dirt till 2015 or 16, nothing built, nothing, you know, no windows, nothing, no, no, nothing inside it. And when they took pictures of the skyline, they would airbrush that out of the skyline in pictures because they didn't (laughs) want anybody to see it. Unbelievable. (laughs) And, like yeah, they don't you call go it the hermit kingdom for nothing. I mean, it's just, exactly. just bizarre. They just try to control the image of everything. And there's no cars really in the city. So you keep the window open in the hotel because the AC doesn't work for shit. You keep the window open and you realize in the morning you can hear people singing uh, because the whole city, the workers and stuff like that, they sing the national anthem in the morning, which sounds really weird until you realize that as kids we sing the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, but it's like the whole country does it. And so you can hear them doing that because there's no city noise. There's no industry. There are no cars. So you hear construction equipment that's two miles away. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's very, very strange. And, yeah, you leave the hotel to go to tourist 
sites, which are, are things like flower exhibitions, the mausoleum where Kim Jong Un and or sorry Kim Jong Il and Kim Il Sung are interred in state, which means in a big glass box like Mao. Oh my God. Um, very strange. That is strange. And there's a lot of other strange things that you have to see, like these museums they kind of make you go to that are very socialist. Socialists are big on propaganda. Well, and it's very unsophisticated propaganda in that you'll go there and they're like, I, I, I ask a lot of questions there and I tow the I tow the line, if you will, where we'll see a painting and it'll be a baby in the arms of a man shooting. And they're like, this is Kim Il-sung. He's in the army. He's holding baby General Kim Jong Il, and he's fighting the Japanese. And in this battle, he killed over a hundred Japanese. And I said, with a pistol. And they're like, yes. <laughs> and then I said, how come he didn't get shot? And they're like, the Japanese were not able to hit him because he's such a good fighter. And I said, even with a baby in his hands, yes. And I said, why did he bring a baby into a battle? And then it's like, <laughs> pause, talk amongst each other for a while. The guides, da 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 da. They're talking. They're talking. They're talking. They say. Let's get back to you on that. And then we, you know, 20 minutes goes by, and then she goes, I have an answer to your question. She brought General Kim Jong-il there so he would learn how to fight, even as a baby. And I'm like, got it. You didn't Google this. You didn't read anything. You just thought of this shit on your own. You realize I've been with you the whole time since I asked this question of you, right? Like, you, I know you didn't refer to any history when I, after I asked you the question, but they're just like, and they're just thinking at the time, crap, I better figure this one out. I can't not know the answer to this question. So they just make it up. <laughs> and I found endless entertainment in these questions. And I remember thinking, man, you know, I could get in trouble for this. I better tone it down. And I was drinking with our tour guide uh, as we did every single night. And I said, hey, look, am I am I doing anything that's rude? I don't want to get in trouble. You know, and he, they said, no, you're clearly the only one who's really interested because you're the one who's asking the most questions. <laughs> And I thought, all right, as long as I look interested, we're good. Oh, man, you can't make that stuff up. That's too good. Wow. I only publicly support companies and products that I personally use and have found valuable. So I wanted to tell you about Qualia. Now, I'm not a supplement geek. I don't find them useful if I'm fueling properly. But when it comes to my cognitive strength and brain health, I am excited about the emerging industry of nootropic supplements. I've been testing Qualia designed by my friends at the Neurohacker Collective for several months now, and it's on the bleeding edge of nootropic research and has become the one supplement that I won't go without on a daily basis. Qualia stimulates what's called broad-spectrum cognitive enhancement, which involves optimizing multiple cognitive variables simultaneously rather than focusing on a single variable. For example, it brings me greater ability to focus and makes me feel more connected while not diminishing my overall awareness of the environment. I experience a systematic enhancement of my brain's ability to take in and process information without any stimulating effect, which would make me feel agitated like caffeine or depleted after the effect wears off. Now, for a busy entrepreneur and athlete like me, it's a no-brainer to invest in my brain health with Qualia. You can get on the Qualia bandwagon with me by visiting neurohacker.com that's N-E-U-R-O-H-A-C-K-E-R.com and use the code UNBEATABLEMIND15R. That's UNBEATABLEMIND15R to get 15% off the life of your order. Trust me on this one. You won't be disappointed with Qualia. All right, so let's do, um, let's shift tactics a little bit here and talk about the art of charm. You know, the, the story I could go on and on with your stories because they're fascinating. And I love going to places like that too. Or at least I did when I had my team of 16 guys toting a lot of weaponry with me. I'm not yeah. sure I want to go alone like you did, but that's another point. At any rate, let's talk about communication strategies. You know, and I remember when we first did our podcast, our aborted effort, we talked about charm school for adults and how like in the military, they send anyone who gets selected to flag rank. That's either a general in the, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, or an Admiral in the Navy, they send you to literally what they, they don't call it officially, but all the operators call it charm school. And this is where they literally, you know, they say, okay, so if you're, if you're having a state dinner in China, you know, and you know, this is, this is the protocols, right? If someone serves you a drink, you drink it, you know what I mean? And, uh, 
you know, like if you're in Korea and they serve you a food that has, that looks like it comes from some body of water, but it's got 16 eyeballs and 27 limbs, you eat it regardless because it's respectful not to and stuff like that. But your charm school is mostly about communication. Is that right? And, And so, yeah, it's about nonverbal communication, body language, persuasion, influence, and the things that I discussed kind of with talking about when we were talking about changing to the logical brain versus the emotional brain, very sort of practical psychology that will help people in specific situations, whether those situations are sales or self-preservation. Right. Okay. So let's let's take a couple scenarios, if you will. Um, what about, uh, let's say someone is really shy and timid, like what are some strategies that they can use to, to kind of project a little bit more? power and to overcome that timidity. Sure. So here's something that we call the doorway drill. And I think it's great. This is a really good drill to sort of wrap on because it's very practical and anyone can do it. This is called the doorway drill. And at AOC, this is something that I, we, t- we have a billion of these little types of drills. We know that our nonverbal, you know, l- let me just sort of back up the truck. We know that our first impressions are important. That kind of goes without saying. It's almost a cliche. You know, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression and all that jazz. We know that these are crucial, and we know that these are important things that most people don't necessarily know how to manage. What we espouse here at The Art of Charm is that your first impression is not verbal. It is completely nonverbal. And if you don't believe me, the way to test this is to go to the mall or walk down the street And you'll find that you're making judgments about the people that you see. So you'll walk through a mall and it'll be like tall, overweight, Mm -hmm. friendly looking, attractive, athletic, Mm -hmm. scary, threatening. And if you don't believe me, just go ahead and try that for yourself. And then, you know, come back and listen to this part again after you've proven to yourself that you do make silent judgments about other people and that it's okay. And, you know, if you're feeling guilty about it, it's something that you've evolved. It doesn't mean you're a bad person Uh, because I know the the regressive left research has proven that out right so brain research and how the you know like kahneman's work on the system one system two mind you know there's so much information flooding your mind that the system you know what he says is system one is that quick neat you know quick reactions subconscious mind that's primed to think a certain way based upon the patterns that you've been living in so to speak and so yeah you know one person could see tall and think attractive another person could see tall and think scary you know and based upon how they're primed but those are all pre-cognitive almost like you said precisely yeah exactly exactly and so we know that this is true and i know that a lot of people have a problem with this because society says now that judging people before you know them is wrong and stuff so i just want to dispense with all that but we know that the first impression is made that way Mm -hmm. now so what that means for us is that a lot of people go okay i need to have great nonverbal communication when i make a first impression. So next time I go to an event, I'm going to remember to have good body language, the end. And that's where most people fail because they leave it there. So what we do is we say, no, no, no. Great, open, positive body language is something that you can't just decide to do on cue. Because if you try to do it on cue, what happens is you look at the interaction and you go, great, I'm going to go to this mixer or this this workshop and I'm going to look really positive and stand up straight and smile. And then you go, crap, I've got to micromanage now all my nonverbal communication while listening and being present in the conversation and talking and thinking about my agenda for this conversation, et cetera. That's a big problem. You can't do that. Your brain doesn't have enough bandwidth to do that. And so we have to relegate and delegate our nonverbal communication to the level of habit. And the way that we do that is by automating it. And the way that we do that is through the doorway drill. And so the doorway drill, if right now, as long as you're not driving, stand up straight, chin up, shoulders back, chest up, smile on your face. So standing up straight, chin up, shoulders back, chest up, smile on your face. You don't have to exaggerate this. You'll look like an idiot. It's not necessary. We're just trying to find open, positive body language that makes us look confident, but friendly and open. And now this is what we're trying to go for. Now the problem is if we just try to remember to do this when we walk in somewhere, we will we would this is I think also a seal saying and you'll correct me on this one if I'm wrong, but we don't rise to the level of our expectation, we default to the level of our training. Mm-hmm. Right? True. So 
we we can't think next time I go to a mixer or an event or my office, I'm going to remember to do this. No, you're going to default to hunched over the computer position just like you are right now, most likely for a lot of us. And, uh, and if you're if you're athletic, you might have an overly physical presence that's intimidating. So you might have the confident part down, but you don't have the positive part down. So we want to create that open, positive, confident body language. We got to create that habit. So what we do is every time we walk through a doorway in our own house, in our office, no matter where we are, you reset to chin up, shoulders back, chest up, smile on your face, and you keep that very natural. And I know the problem is people are going to hear this and they're going to walk out their their door from where, or into the door wherever they, you know, from their car into their office and they're going to forget to do this. So because we could walk through doorways all day, we're on autopilot. We need to break that autopilot. So right. grab a set of post-it notes. If they're bright pink or bright blue or whatever, even better, rip them and put them at eye level in the door frame. So when you walk through those door frames, the ones you see most often in your home and in your office, you see that post-it note. You don't have to write anything on it. You see it and you go, what the heck is that doing there? Oh, right. Doorway drill. Open, upright, positive body language. If you do that through the, every doorway throughout the day, you're going to create a habit where your default body language and nonverbal communication is open, upright, and positive. That is huge mm -hmm. because now when you walk into doors that don't have a post-it note you're going to notice and you're going to have that as your default nonverbal communication and what this does not only does it make you look open upright positive confident and friendly what this does is it informs now that we've know we, we know that our first impression is nonverbal we know that other people are judging us by our nonverbals just as we are judging them by theirs mm -hmm. so this causes other people to treat us differently they right. treat us as if we are confident, open, upright, positive, friendly, etc. That, in turn, informs the way that we think about ourselves because the way that we are treated informs the image we have of ourselves. So now we start to think of ourselves as confident, open, friendly people. We're treated as open and confident, friendly people, and that is a virtuous cycle. And then eventually you can take those Post-it notes down because you've experienced what we at AOC like to call a core level or an identity level shift. And that is huge. It means it's changed who you actually are. You're no longer pretending to do something. You're no longer manually a part of this process. This is actually who you are now, and it's a, it's a change for the better. You've built a habit that's changed the mindset, which has changed the way that you view yourself. Right. And yeah. that creates great nonverbal communication that you don't have to think about that then informs who you are as a person. Right. Does that make no, sense? That's, that's terrific, yeah. And we, we, you know, we used to have a saying, fake it till you make it. And, you know, it's easy to take that the wrong way. But the reality is, you know, if you may not feel open, confident, you know, positive, but the more you pretend to be, the more you get your physiology and your mindset into that position and your posture is, like you said, the best way to do that, then eventually you're going to get that positive feedback loop going. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, one day you're going to be like, I am open confident and positive all of a sudden. So I faked it until I made it until I made it. We we do, you know, we do drills like that to develop courage at Seal Fit. One of the things that we do is like a, a practical way to to force people into the habit of standing up straight is to punish them so to speak, but it's not punish, but to to have some sort of consequence that the team must participate in and it usually looks a lot like a burpee when anyone in the team is caught with their hands on their hips. Cuz hands in your hips, you know, I've heard actually someone say, hey, this is a position of power. You put your hands on your hips. I'm like, no, that's a position of weakness for, for a couple of reasons that, that you'll get. One is it does close, you know, rounds your shoulders. You get an internal rotation on your shoulders. It shuts off your chest cavity and it, it, it leads to kind of a slight hunch in your posture. So hands on hip is a bad, bad idea. You want to have your hands off hip, you know, facing forward, shoulders back, you know, chin up, smile on your face, like you said. And so anytime we find someone with their hands on their hips, just kind of loitering around, then, you know, it's another hundred burpee penalty. So we could accrue usually several thousand burpees this way that have to be worked off. So it's kind of a, a harsh way to get to the, you know, to get the same uh, results. I think probably the, the uh, sticky on the door jam is preferable to most people. But anyways, that's our thing. All right, Jordan, that is pretty interesting. I would love to continue on with this discussion about how to develop confidence and power uh, through the art of charm. But uh, we kind of run out of time. So why don't um, I ask you to tell folks where they can find out more information about you and about your seminars and, and your practical uh, drills and your online training and stuff like that. Sure. So you're already listening to a podcast. So I highly, I would love it if people would come to the Art of Charm and check out some of our interviews. Everything we've got there 
is designed to help you with something like the doorway drill. There's practical use and application in everything, whether it's Shaquille O'Neal talking about how he has a panel to help him make tough decisions. We had General McChrystal on talking about making tough choices. Nice. That's a guy who's had to make some tough choices in the past, of course, as you uh, might imagine. Yep. And there's a lot of folks there that are just extremely knowledgeable and have amazing, unique stories as well. And we offer practical stuff like this all the time. So, yeah, you're listening to a podcast. I'd love it if people would check out the Art of Charm podcast as well. And also, of course, at theartofcharm.com, we have challenges and things like that, which like the doorway drill that are just all practicals. And there's a lot of resources there as well. Awesome. So check out the Art of Charm podcast and theartofcharm.com. Jordan, um, super stoked. Thanks very much for uh, doing this take two. I look forward to meeting you in person and uh, keep up the great work, buddy. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. All right, everyone. That's it. Uh, Thank you so much for your attention. Really appreciate it. Stay focused and uh, train that courage. And and I I challenge you to practice the the door drill for 30 days. That's actually, that's money. I can see a lot of value in that. And until next time, train hard, stay focused and hone that unbeatable mind. Hoo-ya. Divine out. Hey, this is Mark Divine. Thanks very much for watching the Unbeatable Mind podcast on YouTube. You can also find the podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, and unbeatablemind.com slash podcast. Be sure to check out the new episode released every week. Hoo-yah.